you know, why don't you just get that out of the way now before we uh, get this thing started? I like gloom. Good evening. It's Wednesday at 9 p.m. This is the What Not Podcast, where we welcome you to the podcast where we put the what into what not. I'm Mike Z. And at 9.01 p.m., I'm Chris. And I'm Kyle. Thank you for joining us, everyone. And tonight mm-hmm. is part two of the What You Should Know Before You Get a CNC. And so we're kind of continuing that now with the, what is it, the bits and the accessories. That's what happens when you run out of time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. So uh, I'm going to let these two fine gentlemen talk most of the evening, and I'm just going to do, I guess, things in the background and wait. Okay. Well, you know, in a little sequencing there of your uh, intro. Yeah. Uh, what was what did that screen say right before you the, the like and subscribe? I was trying to read it, and it went by so fast, and the letters were all pl- spanned apart, and it just my little brain can't function that fast. <laughs> Uh, it was the same thing as it has been as far as sponsored by, hosted by, Patreon supported, oh, that stuff. Okay. Trying something new and, and it looked better when I was editing it than it did now. That's okay. When I watch it tomorrow, I'll pause at that place so I can properly do it. <laughs> and you who are watching now may want to reverse and do the same. <laughs> yeah, there you go. go ahead and get that delay going. Yeah. So obviously last week we were talking a lot about cnc and we covered uh machinery and kind of what to look for the differences in the the quality of the machines the type of the machines and uh, some of the different characteristics that uh you know you may be interested in and uh, so tonight we figured uh we'd kind of veer a little bit away from the actual machines and start talking about all the other paraphernalia that you need when you get a cnc we think kyle that kind of sounded about right Sounds about right. Okay. Yeah. Because what good's a CNC if you don't have stuff and accessories and goodies to go with it? And empty pockets. <laughs> That's what comes yeah. after. <laughs> and when you're getting started, you know, it's always good to maybe double up on the bits you buy because, you know, bound to break at least one. For sure. And not because the bits are bad quality. Well, sometimes that might be it. But So is that a good point to someone who's starting out is to find a bit that maybe they're going to need to do for a project and get two of them just in case? It's helpful. Okay. Because sometimes breaking a bit is um, not the fault of the bit or the fault of the setting that you've done. And Mike, you well know breaking bits and uh, things like that happened a couple times on my projects. Yes. And or slipped. Like, Sometimes it has zero to do with with the bit or the way you've set it up. Sometimes you just accidentally push the wrong button. Could be. That's the truth. And good evening, John. He says, here's Johnny. All right. Welcome to the show. Yes. Welcome to the show, Johnny. That was bad. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, Edmund Mann, not sponsored. Rolling over in his grave right now, trying to figure out why that was said. Wasn't like I was trying to sell them Publishers Clearinghouse or something. <laughs> All those kids at home weren't aware of who Ed McMahon was. Well, they'll go look that up and figure that out from there. So, all right. So, you know, we got a lot of stuff to talk about and uh, a little bit of time to get it in. So, figure we'll just kind of pick back up. Uh, Kyle, did you have anything else you wanted to add from last week that maybe we forgot about to talk about? I think we covered it pretty good uh, on the CNC side of it. Uh, I think we have a lot to cover this episode so mm-hmm. could either go uh do you want to start with bits or accessories you know what you're the guest you choose and we'll just follow along well we already started with bits so we might as well just continue that huh yeah, keep it on the right track yeah 
So, uh, you know, we're talking about bits. Uh, obviously, you know, a lot of people, will, at least it's, this is a question I get a lot due to my day job is, well, I want I want a big I want a set of like 15 bits so I don't have to worry about it. M- my philosophy on sets vers- versus buying individually may v- differ from other people. My philosophy is smaller sets may be okay because smaller sets typically have the two or three bits you're going to use a lot of, whereas a bigger set, they may be handy to have, but they may not always have every bit you're going to use. So you may have a couple bits you never use, and you wasted your money. So I always try to steer people into either buying them individually or buying a small set that you know has got bits to use and then progress as you know what kind of projects you're going to get into. I don't know. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I feel the same way. I, I use probably five bits the most and then i have maybe 10 bits i never heard to use except for that one special project but then some of the ones i use most i may have like three of them just to have extras it's like the whole uh, background changed in my <laughs> lost yeah sorry about that sitting over here trying to i forgot i had okay so i forgot i had made kyle his own folder with all of his stuff in it and I just realized it's right there. So, sorry. Mike says, I wonder what happens if I push this button. <laughs> what are they talking about? Bit for? Oh, hey, look, there's a plus here. What does this do? At least it didn't terminate the broadcast. Yeah. yeah thanks for all that. <laughs> for watching, folks. That was all for tonight. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it's not just that, too, but it also, what kind of bit you choose will be driven based on what kind of CNC work you want to do. I mean, are you just looking to, you know, be carved signs? Are you looking to, just work with plexiglass material or, or plastic material? Um, are you looking to do 3D work? You know, all of those different types of projects are going to require slightly different bit types. So, you know, if you're getting into CNC, it's kind of important to have a at least an initial game plan. It's always easy to expand once you get into it. But, you know, don't go in thinking you're going to do everything, you know, your first week. Find a couple of, of projects that you know you can start with to get comfortable with the new machine, to get comfortable with what the bits are going to do, how to set everything up. And so, you know, the most common bits, you know, I would say my top three would be, you know, a 60 degree V bit, an eighth inch down cut, and maybe a quarter inch down cut, possibly an up cut, depending on what you're going to need. But those are kind of the top three that I would say most beginners would kind of you could live on easily yeah 60 degree v bit is probably my top used bit for signs and then i use compression bits a lot for cutouts and then if i'm doing acrylic work or something i'll do uh single flutes yep um just to interrupt you guys here let me know when it would be a good time to show off the bits Oh, well, could start now if you want. Okay. So well, we, we were going to save that for later, but clearly Mike's oh, yeah. to <laughs> I'm going to click all the buttons. <laughs> well, go go back to that image because that's sure. a perfect Im- no, the the one that you had that had all the little red lines in it. There, I guess uh, so many. There Thanks. you go. Um, this particular image is a, is a really good discussion because, you know, we mo- both Kyle and I said 60 degree V-bit. And there's a reason. Um, if, if you go with a 90 degree V-bit, which is what a lot of people like think they want it it has such a wide angle that you don't get a very deep cut hi kyle (laughs) (laughs) and the problem you run into is without that with that with that cut that's not very deep you don't get a lot of detail and so unless you're making big signs for like outdoors then you know that 90 degrees sometimes may not be the best option Let's get rid of that. I want the guest back in. <laughs> we had a complaint that you were your volume was very low, so I had to increase it. Don't get close to the mic, though, because I've already increased it. You're talking about me? Yeah. Oh, okay. So don't do this? You can do that. It's okay. okay. Just don't get louder on purpose because I've already adjusted it. Sorry. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So so that's kind of an important thing. And, and if you ever look at what sign shops look at when they make signs for outdoors, they, they have sort of what they call a, a, view, a view map or a, a, how far away you have to be to see a letter on a sign. And that varies based on the distance and, you know, the type of bit you use certainly will, will make that. And most of us aren't making signs for, you know, roads and being seen from half a mile away. We're making them to be seen across the living room or, you know, whatever. So 
knowing whether you're going to do a 60 degree or 90 degree on your v-bit you know that's kind of important and then what type of 60 or 90 degree right now there's three main types wouldn't you say of of v-bits that are available uh you're talking like inserts and the stuff insert, like that solid carbide versus carbide tipped yeah yep well, what's your favorite uh, I got into the inserts, and once you do that, you don't go back. It's, I like them because once the blade goes dull, you just swap the blade out, and you're good to go. But yeah. the regular ones have their place, too. Well, I'm I'm, a, I'm more of a fan of those than the carbide-tipped version, but I'm, I'm real preferential to my uh, three-flute 60-degree solid carbide bit with the Spectre coating that, uh, that's kind of my go-to for yeah i see you using that one a lot uh, i like it it lasts long and leaves a clean cut plus with the you get a little faster feed rates with those versus the insert tooling I, uh the insert tooling i made uh i make these little tiny signs they're like nine inches by two inches and I made over four thousand of them last year and i probably replaced the insert blade probably four times so well i say about get about a thousand signs per per blade which is pretty good i and did that's a thousand an, that, and two with mine <laughs> <laughs> i don't have to see what kind you get <laughs> no that, that that was pine so hmm. it's not too hard on the bits unless you had a knot or something sorry to cover you up there uh kyle but uh rick says that three bit amana set set up or three bit of mana set that was a great that that was up is great it's a little costly but it has easily replaced inserts which are actually much less expensive than regular bits another thing is um the some of the 90 degree v bits have a completely square insert so you have four tips on that so if one tip goes bad you just loosen the screw rotate it 45 degrees tighten the screw and then you got another tip to get four uses out of one one insert. Now, coming from the not the side of CNC, but dealing with carbide inserts, are they indexed to where you know where you started, and so that way you know when you get back around, it's time for a new one. They do have a little mark on them. I know that, um, but I don't think all all of them have that. But I know the ones I use have a little mark. I know that usually shows a sign of quality uh, manufacturing whenever they have some sort of index mark, and they're not cheap. I don't know if that helps any for anyone. Sure. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. And I, I did have prob some problems with uh, sometimes when they, like a 60 degree, when it only has one screw in the middle, sometimes it's hard to get the blade just perfectly seated. You have to make sure the groove is real clean and everything. Are you so talking about like that? Yeah, mm -hmm. like the one in the middle. That's my most used bit. That's a 60 degree. You see the one on the right has two screws and the little stop at the bottom. Uh -huh. So that, that blade... Uh, sits there perfectly. It's kind of hard to mess that one up. And that one you could spin around, use it twice. The one in the middle, if you don't have that groove real clean, if you have some uh, wood or something in there, if you don't seat it just right, it could be off a little bit uh, when you uh, go to put it in. And Mike, remember the shop knobs I made, how some of the lettering had little weird donuts at the bottom of the cut? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's caused by not getting the yep. cutter oriented just right in line. So therefore, yeah, basically, it's awesome. cutting like a yeah. Uh, yep. And if you remember that that first uh, sixty I got like that, I never could get that right. No matter how I seated it, it would not it would not get right. And I ended up sending it back, and they said, yeah, there was an issue with uh, the die on a few runs. So, mm -hmm. yeah. If it, okay, so Rick said it was the. We had the photo of it on the screen. I'm trying to figure out. I think that's the one you just showed there. He's talking there. about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I have all three of those, and all three work good. But that one in the middle, the 60 degrees, when I use the most. So that one's used the most, but also the one that can be the most trouble if you're not paying attention in a hurry. Well, basically. the one on the left, too, is a 45 degree. Yeah. That's the same issue there. But yeah. the reason I use the 60 most is just because the type of engravings I do. Mm -hmm. Uh. 60 is probably the most common, uh, so is the 90. But the 90 is more for wider cuts and not as deep. And then if you're using smaller letters, you want the uh, finer angle 
to do like a 60. When you do a 60, you go a little bit deeper on the cut. So that's the, so that would be the difference of the one on the far left versus the right is that you're going to have a much better precise look to it when you're. Yeah. If you, if you show that other chart that I made, uh, mm -hmm. that you showed earlier. Yeah. If you look at the middle row, uh, you see the nineties on the left and it's cutting a three eighths inch wide slot, but it's not going too deep. And then if you look at the 60 degree right next to it, it's cutting that same width slot, but it's going a little bit deeper. So you can okay. see each time you go smaller V bit, the cut will go deeper, but still cut the same width of a line. And then the same thing at the top, if you cut the same depth with all those bits, it's going to cut uh, a narrower line every time you go down in a in an angle V bit. Interesting. Didn't think of it that way, but that's uh, yeah, that makes complete sense. Yeah, and if anybody wants this chart, I have it available uh, on my website. Which uh, is, hey, well, you can go to learn your season, learn your CNC dot com forward slash whatnot dash podcast, and then I have the link there. Oh, I think Mike can probably put the link down in the description once we're done with all this. I believe. Oh yeah, 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 that'll work. Go ahead. And so check down in the description there. We want Kyle. Sorry, Kyle. Kyle. Yeah. We want Kyle. <laughs> ah. Hitting too many buttons. It went even worse. It was like the wide poster there. You yeah, I was like, what Kyle? <laughs> There's no Kyle. Because what image do we have that completely would cover Kyle up? I have a video oh. we could show. <laughs> completely <laughs> cover everybody. You could probably show one of the V-Bit uh, videos if you want. Okay. I think uh, Chris had a good one there. The one with the blue aura mask? Yeah. Blue aura mask. So I'm going to try this one. Cover your ears. Oh, not that one. Okay. That's the end mill. I don't have that one loaded up, or is it this one? Nope. nope. That's not it. Then I don't have it loaded up. Uh, probably okay. one of the ones that you couldn't load. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, Never mind. We don't have any boo bits to show you. We and it was, a, it was the best one you'd ever oh, see, too. Oh, my gosh. Because it had the bright yeah, blue this. aura mask, and it was using the exact bit we're talking about. I oh, totally loud. Hey, there it is. Look at that. That's a okay. 60, right? Yep. For those of you who are listening at home or watching a video, we do apologize. Next time, well, catch it live on Whatnot yeah. Podcast on YouTube and Facebook. Yeah, go, go catch it live. That way you see yeah. pictures. But yeah, that that's uh, that it does leave a very clean cut, and I like it. If, if I'm using Aura Mask, I prefer that over a traditional carbide or solid carbide or carbide tipped, because yeah. it doesn't tend to want to pull the the Aura Mask, especially when you got a fresh blade on there. Yeah. So John says that he like or we like using the thirty degree bit on our ornaments. Yeah, those are very detailed. Yeah. And the smaller you get, the more that becomes the case. Speaking of ornaments, we can switch over to uh, the drag bits if you want. I have a video on you the do? drag bit on an ornament if you have if you have that video. Is it well let's see, I have a drag bit on three plexiglass pieces. Was it one of those? Um uh, you could trick Try one of them. This uh, by the way, everybody, this is what happens when you don't prepare and, and you forget to ask the guest to name the file so you knew what you were looking at because I have no clue what I'm looking at. So I do apologize. It seems unprofessional, but eh, it's our podcast. All right. well, what else would you expect at this point? Oh, there you go. That's it. Okay. So this is a, a Christmas ornament I did, and that's a diamond drag bit. So the letters and stuff were so small that I used that bit there. And it's on the back side of cast acrylic. And the reason you do it on the back side is because you have that nice smooth finish on the front when you flip it around. And it's clear, of course. Now, is this something you would put like a light at the bottom or behind it? Uh, you could, I didn't in this case. No. And in this one, I actually outlined everything. But when I did it again, I actually filled in every all the outlines with an, uh, like a fill. Uh, because I noticed it was really hard to see them after that I did that way. 
But the nice thing about the drag bits is you're just scratching the surface. You're not actually, um, the router is not spinning or the spindle. Okay. So it's pretty quiet and you don't need uh, to have your spindle running while it's going. Yeah, there's some signs I did, uh, some light up signs. And that's all with the diamond drag bit. I like the splatter one. That is pretty cool. Yeah, I didn't like uh, how long that one took. <laughs> how long we took? That one took like 12 hours to engrave with the diamond drag bit. Not that cool. Yeah, it took, it would be much quicker with a laser. So if you have a laser, that's a better option. And then these, this is the drag bit up close. Those are both the bits I use for those acrylic signs. So the left one is a spring-loaded uh, 90 degree uh, diamond drag bit. The right one is a single flute uh, upcut uh, that's made for acrylic. That's a mana spectra coated bit. And that one's yeah, three sixteenths. Nope, sorry. Those are called O flute. Yep, O flute. Yep. Such a cool, and it's like a big ice cream scoop, is how Chris ex described it to me. It's it's a good way to describe it. Yeah. Now, let me ask this on the diamond bit when we were looking at the video, it spring loaded, you said. Yes. Okay, how is that helpful? Because I'm thinking that you can set the Z, you know, what what's the spring going to do for you in that case? Well, if you don't have the spring there and you set it right to your material, when it puts, puts pressure down and starts to move, it could break the tip of the, uh, there's just a little tiny diamond tip on there. Okay. So if it has all that pressure on there and, it, and if the surface is a little bit uneven and it starts to move, it could break that tip off. Also, the spring load is nice if you have an uneven surface and you want to engrave it. It could, the pressure will go up and down with the spring as it goes along the uneven surface. I know it probably seems like a rudimentary question to everybody who uses a CNC, but I'm looking at like, why would you put a, you know, like on a, on a record player, I guess, the diamond hitting on the vinyl, it's using the arm as its spring. So therefore it doesn't get stuck or shoved into a certain spot. So it kind of rides the surface for more accurate cut more accurate sound it's the only way i can think of it well and you can lower or raise your z to to achieve a slightly more or less you know pressure spring spring tension pressure onto the surface but but all it's doing is just etching it that's it yep now i think i've got two more ornament videos here all right that's the signs we were just looking at um it's the same technique just uh engrave on the back side with the diamond drag and then afterwards uh, cut out with that O flute bit. So I know yeah. this may seem obvious but you have to do all this in reverse? Yeah, that's a very important step if you're doing on the back side make sure you mirror it before you um, engrave it. I've done it before where I forgot. I take it you only have to do that once to remember from that one out? Pretty much. And there's uh, the O flute, uh, single flute bit. And I basically, I think I do like three passes on that. And Vetric software, you could actually, that's a profile pass. Mm -hmm. In Vetric, you can actually make the last pass go inwards a little bit to cut the entire depth in one full pass. But the first couple passes remove the material away. So that last pass actually cleans that edge really nicely by offsetting a little bit inwards. And then afterwards, I take a, a torch and torch the edges. And that will uh, pretty much polish the edges uh, with the cast acrylic. Oh, okay, so you're remelting the acrylic, cool. Yeah, and it looks like a, like a glass edge when it's done, it's really smooth. Sweet. That also helps with, uh, if you're going to do that on a lit sign, that also helps to uh prism out that light better. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that, those are a pretty popular sign to do. And the bases there, those I just buy on Amazon, but you can build your own base if you wanted to as well. So now I'm just looking to see what videos we have after this to make sure I got them all loaded up. Okay, so hold on one sec because I don't know where this is going to go. There we go. So I'm on that one now. Well, is that the 3D one? This is Chris. Yeah, I've got three of Chris's 3D ones. 
unless you did a 3D one that's like a candle uh, candle. Do you have do you have that uh, picture of the round bits I showed you? you probably talk about those. It was that new that picture round bits on it. Yeah. Yeah, because there know, we go. See preparedness. So talk to me about round bits. Well, see tapered ball nose. I know when Chris explain that one to me i was kind of like that's neat but what does it do and then when he showed it to me i'm like well okay who thought of that because that's cool so yeah basically the first one we got a standard ball nose and that's usually an upcut spiral and that's basically you can use that for a lot of different applications uh whether you're just making flutes just single flutes you can use it for like a juice groove around a cutting board uh you can use that for 3d carving if you don't have a lot of detail uh, but you could get smaller bits too, as smaller ball nose for more detailed items. And then the, going up to the next tapered ball nose, that one you can see you can get a very fine tip with that, but still have the strength of the uh, shank size there. So that's a 32nd to a quarter inch shank, a uh, 32nd inch diameter tip. So that one allows you to get, carve really detailed uh, 3D objects. Uh, but not have the risk of breaking the bit too easily. And then going up to the next one, that ball end, that one's not used too often, at least by me. I don't know too many people that use those. Uh, but I've seen those used for making like grooves where you can run wires through and it kind of closes the groove at the top if you uh, cut it full depth. Uh, but like I said, I never use that one too much. So I don't know too many people that do. Those also oh. are decent bits if you're looking to make timber. Um, that creates the socket, and then you would use a, an opposing bit on the outside to create that that convex shape so that it would slide into that timber to create oh, okay. sort of a locking. Matter of fact, Amana makes a timber set that I believe uses that exact bit that was on the screen. As almost one of, like one of their bits. So almost like a dovetail, but it said it's round. Correct. Kind of. Yep. It's a stronger timbre than just, you know, sort of a, a, a sort of a semi tongue and groove, so to speak. Yeah. You know, I kind of like the whole speaker wire idea with the ball nose, because couldn't you then take maybe and, and run a ball nose groove and then put in like, a, let's say, like a clear, not a plexiglass, but if you want to do a sign that was lit up, that had the plastic inside that groove and then you lit up one end of it so it would shine through in a way. Does, does that make sense? You're talking about my, like my mind works weird, so I'm sorry. I don't know how to describe it sometimes. But if you were to take a sign and carve out using the ball nose, okay? So if we're looking at that, or the ball end, not the ball nose, sorry, the ball end. And you had, it, it's like a keyway bit in, in router bits to where it cuts a larger hole and then you have like this slot. It will cut it that way? Yeah, you, the only thing is you have to do that one full depth pass. Okay. If you did it in multiple stages, it would take off that top lip. So you'd have to do a one full depth pass. So you have to make sure your chips will clear out. You don't want to build up like uh, the, the chips in there. So it could be a little dangerous of a cut. Okay. You've got to be careful with that. Yeah, it would have you to be also want to pre-cut it with a straight bit. That's a that's a better option yeah. there. That, and okay, then now come I'm back with... Uh, Yep. You know, come back, and come back yeah, that's that what hole. I do at keyhole slots, too. I pre-cut them, the straight bit smaller, and then come back with the keyhole uh, when I'm doing them with the CNC. That makes sense. I was just thinking that if you, it just some sort of different way to make it illuminate through the wood in a very narrow pattern. So you could actually do like a neon sign. Like think of a neon sign that's inside the wood and the wood's kind of covering over top. Oh, okay. I see what you mean. Yeah. That's that's where my brain was thinking when I was like, wait, yeah. man, run a channel? Like, okay. But now that's I see that's a pretty good have, idea. Yeah. He's been running. Okay. Yeah. That's this is what this is what Chris has to deal with. He tells me something. <laughs> I'm like, could you do this with it? And he's like, why would you want to? I don't know. It's just what I thought of. Could you do it? <laughs> so. Definitely possible. And then core box. Yep. Core box. That one's basically like a bowl bit. Like, um, usually it's used. Uh, Chris has a video on that, actually. I don't know if you have it, but uh, not. if you're pocketing out like a big area and you want some round edges or um, you can so, use that. I use I have a picture, too, and you might have. I used it for fluting. I used a fluting toolpath with that and made like a textured panel, like a wall panel with that. 
Chris, do you know what the video looks like and I can find it? It is the, one of those that I gave you. I, oh. I don't remember the name of it, but it um it was one of those where I was doing the trays. Those uh those rosewood trays. I got the family one. Let's try this one. Um, there's one with a bunch of plastic on it. That's not it. Uh-uh. Okay. Here, it it's might get one of the up, it's one of the up close sorry. ones where I'm cutting off the tray. Okay, sorry. Hey, hey, Mike, there's an image on the There you go. I get in there. Good gracious. It would have been nice if they were named. <laughs> Chris. Kyle, Kyle went through the time. Not that one, did I take it? Another V. 60. That's a non insert, right? That is. So that means it is a straight carbide. Solid carbide. Solid carbide. Yeah, that too. Same thing. Yeah. Look at you with your slow mo. Gorgeous. Help me to sleep. So this is your Sunday meditation video. <laughs> I don't remember that music. Apparently, it's in there. I think Mike he, added it after I, the fact. I think he took and edited that video. <laughs> Not at all. I couldn't even name it and find out what I'm looking at. I didn't have time to do that. I, I get complaints because my music I use is too heavy metal and rock and rollish. <laughs> How in the world is the stuff that you put on there too heavy metal and rock and rollish? Mm. Anyhow. But no, that's not the one we were looking for. <laughs> okay, well, since we watched it, that was fantastic. Uh, I got an aluminum. I got that. Big sister. I might. Okay, let me. You guys it's keep talking. You, keep it's probably one you couldn't get. And I'll delete some of those and uh, let's refresh this page. Holy crap, look at them all. There's so many. You guys, I mean, well, not that it's a bad thing. You guys upload a lot and I just don't know what they are. Most of them all have, so everyone knows while you're listening why it's hard for me is because a lot of them are just pictures of collets. They don't really show the pit, so they all kind of look the same. They just look like I'm looking at collets. Um, okay, so you guys keep talking about whatever you want me to put on the screen, and then I'll try to see if I can find it. I got room yeah. now. All right, wonderful. So, you know, we'll come back to some of the bits that we're talking about there, but, um, you know, apart from that, then you you start getting into spiral bits, you know, the uh, the round nose and the V bits. I mean, those are those are fairly common, but they're they're going to be used, especially the ball nose. Unless you're doing three V, they're going to be used a little less than like your V bits and your your spiral end mills. And I don't know about you, and I don't know many CNCers that don't agree with this, but the spiral end mills are way better than than using the carbide tipped straight ones. I don't even know why you'd bother. Would you agree yeah, with that? I agree. When I first started out, I was using straight bits. I didn't know any better. And some some of them I got decent cuts with, but the spirals are definitely way better. Um, and Mike, if you have a, the pictures of those, the spiral bits, uh, show like the difference. One? Yep. Yeah, there we go. So we got up cut there. So that's if you want a clean bottom edge, but it's when it pulls up, if you're using like wood, it will chip out the top. So it's pulling that those wood fibers up. And so if you want a nice clean edge, you'd want the clean edge on the bottom. Uh, but that's better. You can cut faster with that because the, ch the chips evacuate out the top and it's clearing the chips as it cuts. And then we have the down cut. Okay, that one's if you want cleaner top edges. So your finished surface you'd want on the top, but this one is gonna force the chips uh, or the material down into your cut. So you wanna run your tool a little slower when you use this one. Uh, I generally use this one for cutting pockets, if you're cutting a pocket. Uh, another thing you could do is run the down cut uh, one pass on the top edge and then switch to an up cut to finish the cut and you can go a little bit faster with the upcut, pulling the chips out. Or you can use a combination of the two and... Come ah, fresh. How did Ooh. I know that was your next picture? <laughs> so this is the kind of marriage of both of them. At the bottom is upcut portion. And then at the top is a downcut portion. So that's going to force the chips 
from the top down and then from the chips from the bottom up. So that one, you have the first uh, pass you make has to be deeper than the upcut portion for that to work. So if you cut a very shallow cut, you're going to be basically cutting with the upcut portion and you're going to still pull the fibers up at the top. So that first pass, you want to know, basically the specs of the tool usually tell you um, the, the depth of that first uh, upcut portion. So you want to set your first pass to be deeper than that. That way the downcut portion is what's riding on the surface of the top edge. Uh, it, if your machine can handle it, you could cut that in one full pass, depending on the material. Uh, but th if you do a one full pass, then you basically uh, cutting up at the bottom and down at the top, and you get a nice, clean, uh, finished edge when you're done. Now, is yeah. it... oh, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, just be be aware that the thickness of your material will determine whether or not you should try that in one pass. You yep. know, for instance, if you're if you're using three quarter material using a quarter inch compression may not be the best idea, especially if you have a, a lesser quality entry level machine, because it will create a lot of side deflection as that bit yeah. is, is, is running. So yep. you get a lot of chatter. Now they do make a variation of that compression bit that has a smaller upcut than the normal. And that's called a mortise compression. Those are real handy. If I typically try to buy those if, if they're available in the size I'm looking for. It just gives you a little more freedom to make that shallower first pass because it typically it has a, a much shorter upcut. Yep. So I have a really good question, and we got on the topic of the, the round nose there, but John wants to know, could you use a drag bit to etch QR code? I don't see why not, but... Uh... Also, it might depend on the material, too, because if you use it on clear acrylic, I don't know if, how good it would scan. Uh, that's probably something good to test out before you do it. But it's definitely possible to, to engrave it with the drag bit. Be interesting to find out. QR code, the future. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how that would scan, because that, that does require those. I know, barcode, I know the way barcodes work is it actually scans the white, not the black. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how the QR codes work exactly. If it's the same, same way, thing, same thing, right. just in a quadrant form instead of a linear form. Yeah. Because anywhere you scan a barcode from top to bottom is the same, but on a QR code, it's it it's technically supposed to be four quadrants of the same thing. So a camera, any kind of camera, can pick it up from a distance. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. There worth you. a shot. Mm -hmm. And welcome to uh, QR Code One Hundred One tonight on uh, the Whatnot Podcast. This has been not brought to you by Cheerwine. Or drink of the South. Don't even have it. I wish I did, though. All right. So, anyway, is there uh, anything, anything else we might need to cover on bits? Because we still got a couple topics to talk about here. Hey, Mike, did you find that picture of the, the textured panel? It's like, uh, that's what I carved. The, it should be in the videos. Oh. Textured right. panel. I think it's this one. Nope, that's a 3D carve. That's a tapered ball nose there. All I have is Chris's stuff here. Hold on, I'm looking at it all was, of yours over here. Do you know it what it's in there? Like? I saw it. I know, I'm probably sure it was. I'm telling you, there's way more videos in here now than there was earlier. And I'll let everyone know that refreshing your browser will allow you to see new additions to your Google Drive. And if you're not quite sure, F5 is your friend. Tech uh, tip is it of the day. Family one? Uh, no, it's, it would be, it looks like a bamboo. It's like a, oh, it's like a bamboo. Got it. Ripples it's a picture. In it. it's, a yeah. picture. it's a picture in the video files. Yeah. See, this is why I got confused. I see now. Great job, Kyle. <laughs> Anytime. Every week. That's what we strive to do is confuse the Z. Doing great this week. I can't, I can't even believe how awesome you guys got me. I feel like I'm trolled right now. That's all right. Where do we start talking there about finishing? So that was done with the, the core box bit. And that was a fluting toolpath in Vetric. And basically it just does a little swoop going from the surface down to the center of the, of the uh, groove there and then back up to the surface. And you just do that multiple times in an array pattern. And you get something like that. That's a two-inch 
core box bit that I use for that. And that's bamboo there. Okay, so again, welcome Kyle to my brain. Can you do that on polystyrene foam? Yes. I don't see why not. Well, I didn't know if it cut really well. It's a core box bit. I don't really have the best of luck in wood with core box bits. It always seems like something binds up on them. But okay. Now, uh, uh, something to note when you do something like that, when you remove that much material from one side, it's going to start to bow the wood. So you definitely want to do something on the back side to help prevent that. Uh, generally, what I do is if I have the thickness, you can run some V grooves in the back, and that kind of relieves the stress a little bit. Um, this is other, if you made it double sided as well, that would help. Um, or glue two panels together, something like that. Yeah, because you're definitely going to take a lot of stress off of one side, and it's going to start to curl on you. Plywood can be your friend. Yes. Yeah, but this, this here, this is a bamboo plywood. They call it plyboo. That is the, <laughs> that's that's the, the laziest thing. name I've ever heard. <laughs> it works, but it, it, oh, man. I'm sorry to whoever came up with that. But uh, anyhow, so that is cool. Yeah. That looks cool. I can I'm thinking of acoustics. Like that would be really nice in a in a sound room or a studio or something where you want acoustics, but you want something very modern looking. That would be cool. Okay, we got a lot to cover. I can stop talking about that now. Yeah, sure. You got it. Delete. I got two of those. Go figure. All right, what's next? What am I missing? We got videos. I do have a video of that uh, being carved out. I don't know if you have that video. Of course I don't. With the core box bit. <laughs> It's in the other folder. It's in the other <laughs> it, it, it's in oh, the uh, CNC accessory folder. Well, I say, <laughs> now that I see what I'm looking for, I can probably get it in here. Look at that. Hey, thank I, you I all for uh, enduring our uh, fun time tonight. Oh, man. Appreciate I'm that. so glad we didn't. we weren't on the spot tonight for a sponsorship or anything. We gave the guy that has no idea about this topic control over the files. Well, and you did try welcome. to name it, Kyle. You did try to name it. I did they try. Textured panel now. I see them. Okay, so let me open. Wait. Wow. Oh, okay, so sorry about that. I don't like that feature. I'm going to complain about that. That's it there. You can see that's a, a two-inch uh, box core bit there. And I think I did it in three passes. And it's just swooping up and down like a, a flute this isn't a machine you have at home is it no nope this is a 5 by 12 industrial machine okay i was gonna oh. say because it didn't look like an inventables double-headed quick no. change machine yeah he only uh, uses that dewalt router on the second gantry <laughs> <laughs> that's so, for the cleanup pass there you go all right, so now I can see I'm removing them as I go, so I know I have already showed them. Nice. There's some sort of organization here, I promise. What, you guys got to tell me what you got? Family? Uh, I don't know. Mine aren't named, remember? Yeah, yours are by date. I see that. And I also know what yours are. I've seen them a couple of times, once or twice. Oh, so, what, what other bits do we have? We covered uh, end mills, V bits, roundover bits. Yep, you also did. We had this image. I did not put that up there. This is a very good reference uh, for yep. material flow because I can tell you that up, down, whenever you're doing any kind of plywood stuff or anything that you're doing to where you want to make sure you get the clean cut on the right side, it's always helpful to think opposite. I went the wrong way. That's funny. Well, we got comments, by the way. Oh, Scott Houston says evening. Hello, Scott. JP says he just got the internet back. Stupid storms. I mean, hurricanes. Who would have guessed? Glad you're okay, JP. Chris Miller. Yeah. Nice job, Kyle. There you go. You get a little pat on the back from Mr. Miller himself. Thanks, Chris. I uh, see many. Uh, Rick says many of the big Mardi Gras flows that you are polystyrene, that C are polystyrene. They are carved with a giant articulating CNC arm CNC. Fascinating to watch. That would be. Mm hmm. Uh, we covered inserts, but we can cover them again since you're here. That's not Thanks a for joining us late. We may cover them again in a, a week or two. We hint, may. Hint. Oh, is there a hint there? One, one, thing we didn't, right. Good. one thing we didn't mention about inserts is you they're not just V-bits either. You can get them in those uh, ball nose 
bits, they have round ones, they have profile ones, they have all different kinds. I don't have a picture for that. Yeah, what about this one? Nope, that's just a core box. That's a four inch core box compared to a three quarter inch core box. What do you use a four inch for? <laughs> Big project. The same thing you use a small one for, just bigger pieces. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just Thanks. on a larger scale. A much that's, larger the scary, scale. that's the scary bit. Now, the only difference between a core box and that other bit that you had originally started on the show to look for was it was a bowling tray. A bowling tray is similar to a core box, but instead of a solid radius, it comes down on a radius and then it has a flat and then goes yeah. back up on the radius on the other side. So if you're doing a dish, uh, but you still want those curved sides, then then a bowling tray bit's the way to want to go. If you're just trying to create um, juice grooves or things like that, then a core box is perfect. Well yeah. Said. That is well said. And if you'd like to, uh, you know, help us a little bit more with the show, since it's so well said, check us out on Patreon, <laughs> the What Not Podcast, where you can help us help ourselves do this more. Now accepting sponsors. That's right. And tonight's show has been brought to you by learnyourcnc.com slash whatnot podcast, where you can There's find a dash all these... in there. You forgot With the dash. A... Oh, is there a... whatnot yes, dash I'm... podcast? I tell you what, trying to give a little bit of nod. <laughs> and then, uh, hey, better? there it is. Okay. <laughs> uh, who uh, Learn Your CNC is where Kyle is from, and he can teach you what you want to know. About Vetric software. He's got a master yeah. class and that master class price is going up soon. So make sure you get on over to learnyourcnc.com to lock in the introductory price before he raises his costs. And he will even teach you things you didn't know you wanted to learn. About Vetric. Correct. Just want to make sure. Maybe that. some other things you never know. And about life in general. I mean, he's, he's a pretty sharp guy. <laughs> <laughs> will the, uh, that, that four inch core box bit sound like a helicopter? You can't yeah. run that on a uh, on a small laminate trimmer. Make sure you have it tight when you uh, start it up. So you don't bottom that one out in the collet. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, don't do that. Okay. What are you getting about? Uh, you know, half an inch per per pass. Yeah. <laughs> one eighth. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, since we've uh, spent so much time on uh, bits. Um, Let's try to recoup ourselves. We did we talk about accessories last week at all? Laser, not really. Access, mm -mm. nope. No. Okay, we'll we'll just skim coat those, and then that way we can go right into software, because that's where that's that's Kyle's wheelhouse. So, when you're buying your CNC, you know you want to buy bits, but part part of that accessory would also be the different things that your the manufacturers offer. Some things you you kind of need to stick specific to your manufacturer. Other things you can kind of veer off, but. Some things would be, you know, lasers and fourth axis uh, turning, which is essentially like being a wood lathe on a CNC. Um, you know, there are other various accessories available, and different manufacturers will have a lot of different options depending on, you know, that setup. For instance, the Avid that was just shown. They have a setup on theirs where you bring your machine all the way, or your gantry all the way up, and you can actually cut dovetails on the end of your piece of wood. And so that's not necessarily available on every manufacturer. So that's kind of a unique feature for that particular brand. Yeah, I see uh, Stepcraft yeah. has that now too. I think Digital Woodcarver has that availability on one of their machines. I remember they, reading They have the that. fourth axis. I remember that. I just don't know if it does the dovetails. Yeah, well, see, the way they do theirs on their machine, their fourth axis mounts off to the side of the machine mm -hmm. but i think they've got one of their machines has a capability of bringing it forward and doing dovetails on the end i'll, I'll have to go back just don't don't hold me to that but i know you can do it on the on the avid and if you really want if you really wanted to any machine you can cut a hole in the bed stick a board vertical in there yeah see so will teach, teach you the better way to do it instead of just <laughs> running your mouth saying i think i know well, that may or may not work depending on whether or not the uh, the Y axis uh, rod is in the way. If the lead screw's down there, you're in trouble. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you just you cut to that too. E either side. Put your gantries back in, boys. It's okay. It's not a measuring contest. <laughs> what else we got for accessories here? All we got right, drag so. knives. I know I've I like this one. I think this is cool. Yeah, drag knives. It's you can cut a lot of different materials with that. It uh, looks like that one there is veneer. 
Uh, you can cut veneer. You can cut cork board, vinyl. Uh, what else? Leather. Cardboard. Leather, yeah, cardboard. All different types of material with that. And that's another one you don't turn the spindle on for. That one, just like the diamond drag bit, it will just uh, drag along the surface with the razor blade there. So Can you just do that with a, Most expensive box cutter you'll ever see. Yes. That is pricey for sure. But it just uses a regular straight blade for a, a box cutter. So. Yep. They have other ones too, like uh, if you ever seen like a Cricut machine, how they have like that little insert and the uh, tip I think is like a wheel. So it, it kind of wheels around cutting stuff. Because if I'm not mistaken, that's an original I, um, way that they did vinyl back in the day. Like if you went to get a big vinyl sign made and you had something cut out, it was on that wheel. It looked like basically a big CNC machine. You know, the the whatever you were cutting would roll through at the same time it's doing its pattern. Yeah. Yeah, the wheel almost looks like a little uh, glass cutter source. Yeah, exactly. What about this? What is this? So that is like a pressure plate. I've actually never used one of those, but I've seen them used before. And that basically is, if you're really ripping through material, that will keep pressure down. Say you're using an upcut and it wants to pull the material up off the table. That will actually put pressure. You can see all four corners have a spring-loaded uh, cylinder there. And that will just leave pressure on the surface while you're speeding through cutting around uh, your material. So basically so just keeping it from lifting off the table. So I would imagine plastics would probably be a real, because, I mean, they're lightweight, thin. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, PVC, stuff like that. I think Izzy made something similar to that on one of his mock-up dust shroud holder things that he made in some of his mad scientist work. Yeah, you might be right. I think I remember seeing something like that. Yeah, and you you only you don't want to use that on three D stuff. That's strictly shoot oh, no. goods. Yeah, just flat two D work. Yep. And and typically you were saying on up cuts, like if you had a diamond or the drag knife, you wouldn't necessarily need it then because you're not actually you know moving yeah. as fast and pulling it off the table. Yeah, I wouldn't use it for those applications. But if you do have material that is pulling off the table, there's always vacuum pod hold downs. Yep. There's those, and then even a regular vacuum table, if you have uh, that option on your machine. I've never tried those pods, but I've tried vacuum tables, and those I know work really good. Yeah, my concern with the pods would be if you're cutting through. Yeah. And, you know, now obviously if you're just barely cutting through, you know, still you run the risk of hitting a gasket or even worse, one of the airlines, but... I don't know. They have their place, I suppose. Yeah. Now there are, Go ahead. there are different types of CNCs. They're called rail and pod machines. And those don't have a flat bed. They just have a bunch of rails and then those pods on there, vacuum pods. Uh, but the new machines actually know where the pods are. So when you make your program, this is a whole different software completely, but uh, I'm talking about a, like a Bessie machine. They have this, the software is called B-Solid. And it actually knows where all the pods are. And when you make your program for your uh, tooling, it will actually tell you where to place the pods to avoid being hit by the machine. So some of the newer machines, uh, this is talking like production machines, are pretty uh, fancy that way. Well into the six figures. Exactly. And John brings up a good point. You can also cut rubber mat with a drag knife. I'm pretty yep. sure anything that you would you would want to cut with a box cutter, basically, or a razor blade would come out really well with that. Yep. Probably not paper, like craft paper. Uh, you know, you're masking uh, off. You think you could pull that off? I think you could, as long as you find a good way to hold it down. Yeah. That's what that foot comes you could in use for. Vacuum pods. <laughs> uh, what else do we have here? We have. So this okay. is a laser module. Yeah, that's the new Vetric laser module. So we talked about lasers a little bit there a little bit ago. With Vetric's new, yeah, if you're using like a JTEC uh, laser, that's one of the more popular ones. Uh, Vetric's new uh, version 10.5 and above, I think. You can actually laser th in 3D. So first you would carve that in 3D, and then you would take the laser 
and have an image over top of that picture or over top of the 3D carving, and you can actually laser the image with that. So the laser will actually move up and down with the surface of the 3D model. That's now, I, I did try that one time. One thing that you have to watch out for that you don't think about when you do it is when you carve that out like a dish there, you have the wall around the 3D. You see that wall there. If your laser, because the laser usually hangs pretty low and has to be close to the surface. If your laser, if you're not paying attention, your laser can hit that wall and that would mess, it, uh, mess up your uh, engraving there. Don't ask me how I know that. Sounds like you have no idea how you know. <laughs> he saw his neighbor do it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you were telling me about that. I mean, I couldn't believe how dumb that neighbor was. He yeah. Was I, I taught him well, though. Don't worry. I, I got him straight now. <laughs> well, um, after after a master course of LearnYourCNC.com, it makes life easy to learn not only your software, but your CNC. Exactly. Sponsored? Sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, let's see here. So the other thing we have is called a pen tool. Yes. So that's basically you turn your CNC into a plotter and you could put a marker, a pen, pencil, whatever you want in there. And that basically you just draw with your CNC. And there's different styles of the uh, of the mounts like that too. Okay. So I see the spring on it. I was going to ask, how do you make sure the felt tip on a Sharpie doesn't crumble? Yeah, they're they're most of them are spring loaded like that. You don't want a solid mount because you will, uh, you will ruin your tip on your marker or whatever you're using. So that's just yes. a regular big or ballpoint pen. Yep. Yeah, because you know. Not yeah, and see that that one is spring loaded as well. Okay, that'd be the only way I could draw something. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So yeah, you're, yeah. you're taking one machine and really turning it into so many different possibilities. just depends on really what your limitations are as a person and what you want to do. Yep. But the beauty is none of that will work worth a diddly do unless you understand the software that's creating the design. And this is where we really want to drive some, spend some time, but clearly we spent you know so much time talking about bits when, yeah, we may be doing that again soon. Now we're, we need to talk about software because really, Kyle, your learnyourcnc.com is probably the best site that I've been on for learning the software. And we could talk about a lot of the other softwares that are out there, but really we're not going to because Vectric is the way to go because that's what you teach. <laughs> it is definitely one of the most popular uh, like hobby softwares. Uh, not even a hobby. I mean, uh, businesses use that too as well. And um, schools. Yeah, schools. But basically, very, very popular. on your learnyourcnc.com, you have a master course that's available for still a limited time price of the introductory price. We can't tell you what that is because it could change. But you get two package options, which is the course only. He doesn't need any extra help. And then you also have the course with live training. And in the live training, you set up a virtual classroom every week and the students get to pick the lessons. Tell me about this. Yeah, basically, uh, when uh, students have issue with the project, they will send it to me and I'll make sure they're okay with me covering that in a group training. And generally they are. And then we'll take that project. And not only will I show that student that was having trouble with it, I'll show everybody in the whole class how to uh, do the project he wants. And that will uh, not only show him how to do it, it'll show everybody how to do it. And then afterwards, that's done live, so everybody can ask questions live. And then afterwards, I record it, and then it's available as a replay to anybody that couldn't make it live or just wants to watch it again. Gotcha. And on the replays, is that an extra cost? No, that's included with uh, everything. Tell you what, the so the reason that we do this is that we found Chris found this and then showed it to me, and then I'm thinking, okay, so if I ever want to learn CNC, like this would be the way I would do it because it's learn as you go. So if you're running the course and let's say you get hung up on something in life on lesson four and you just haven't visited again for like say how long has it been, Chris? Six months? Nine months? 
Oh, it's not been nine months. I, mean, I was just on there a couple of weeks ago. For crying out loud. But if you get hung up and something changes in life, you're, you know, you still got the full course. Like you're, mm-hmm. you got it. It's yours. You do it at your own pace. So if you're, you know, single parent, you're just a general, someone who has a lot going on, but you really want to get into learning this, even this course is where we find it to be great. Now, Kyle doesn't pay us for this. This is all out of our heart, but at the same time, we want to support people who do great things. So we think, Kyle, you do a great job with the learn your CNC. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And also he has the Facebook group, Vetric Tips and Tricks. What's this group? Yep. This is where I share just quick tips. Like, uh, you don't, sometimes you don't want to watch a whole big, long video. It's 10, 20 minutes long. This one, I try to make short and sweet, um, five, five to 10 minute long videos. How to do something like, It's focused on one topic and just quickly show you how to do it. And, uh, just share tips. Okay. And then the other one is the learn your CNC Facebook group. Uh, yeah, that's uh, CNC file help and support. That's more general, general topics uh, around software, not just Vetric. Uh, basically if you have trouble with any software there. And there's some real knowledgeable guys and gals in that group too. So it's not yeah. just Kyle trying to, you know, muscle up and do all the work. There's some really good conversations that go on. Uh, a lot of tips if you pose a question. So that's definitely a good group to uh, to chime in on. Now, I'll say this. There are going to be a lot of people who may watch this and go, well, I'm not going to go pay money. I can go to the old YouTuber and find some free lessons. There's people giving away free lessons. I will tell you, the value that you get from, because I've watched the free stuff too, the value you get from the way Kyle has put this package together, presented it, laid it out, and then and done it in a way where you're not only learning from the start the right way to get things going, but he's teaching you all the little shortcuts at the same time. So you're you're not trying to learn something and then come back, you know, months later and trying to learn shortcuts to do it. He's teaching you how to do a certain thing, teaches you the shortcut way of doing it using the keyboard, and you're learning that in the short little simple videos and then he's got little quizzes after each uh little few few sessions so it's it's well worth the money and and i would i'm telling you jump on this right now before he goes up because you don't want to miss out on this opportunity if you're new to cnc you're new to vectric and it doesn't matter whether it's you know desktop pro cut 2d aspire all are welcome in kyle's little program i appreciate it Yep. And then if you're listening to this after the fact and Kyle has gone up on his price, you won't know because we didn't tell you the price. <laughs> That's why I did it. But at the same time, if you want to, you can definitely use the coupon code on learnyourcnc.com of whatnot hyphen podcast, which will save you 0% on your master course for the whenever you pick this up. That's, That's right. a limited time offer. Limited time offer. And and due to supply chain issues, it's costing more and more for him to deliver this amazing quality of a product to your living room direct where you are. It's so mean, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so while we have uh, some fantastic people looking at learnyourcnc.com slash whatnot hyphen podcast, you know, there's always uh, great resources out there. We like a mana tool due to the fact that they just really kind of leading the way in a lot of CNC types of bits, different types of ways that they're going about the machining of the bits, the inserts. As far as I know, there was only one other company that was doing inserts and really a man has taken off and, and gone full bore with a lot of this, which saves money for the CNC operator. Yeah. And there's a lot of companies out there making just normal spiral bits, but it's not just, can you make a bit that looks like a, you know, spiral. It's the quality of the carbide, the quality of the milling, the accuracy of the milling. And I've used bits where when you go to Mike, the the shank, for instance, and, and that's an important piece, it needs to be really, really close to what it's designated. Otherwise, you could have pretty major issues. In a mana, I've never gotten a bit that was not dead on the money. The quality of cut, the length of life, and the if you see that blue... Uh, that blue is a spectra coating. As far as I'm concerned, um, if I see the blue versus the standard, every single time I'm going to go blue. 
it's it just it does produce a much longer life of a product and that reduces heat what is it a f- friction polish what is that it it's a special coating and it does reduce heat and it offers a much longer life and over the to, over the life of the product and what we're looking at here is Kyle's normal setup right like this is your go to bits yeah these are this is like my most used set there and like I said, that 60 degree V bit is probably my most used. And then after that would be the uh, spiral end mills in the middle there. Yeah, too bad you don't have the uh, the fly cutter spoil board bit video that was in that mix. Yeah. <laughs> I've got That's video. RC 22 55. Oh. Or Give RC me a minute. Dash 2255. And one, a- one, one major thing we didn't mention about bits is the number one enemy, which is heat. And that's a lot of mistakes people make when they first start, is they're afraid of the machine, so they run it slow. And when they run it slow, you're just building up heat on that bit, and you're just wearing it out and making it dull, and it'll probably eventually break. So you definitely want to fine tune your feeds and speeds for whatever the manufacturer recommends, and that will Cutting faster actually is better for the bit because it keeps it cool and ejects the chips out quicker. As long as you're not, uh, yeah, sometimes they'll have too fast of an RPM and too slow of a feed. And it's also bad if you're going the other way where you have too slow of an RPM and too fast of a feed. So there is a, a sweet spot there. Yeah. And and I, I watched and looked and looked and couldn't find any good videos on basically how to sort of set up that feed and speed. For, for entry level machines because all these bit manufacturers like Amana they don't make them for like you and me they make them for industrial customers that are running you know eight thousand inches a minute and um, so I, I did a video on my on my my YouTube channel about doing figuring out the se- the feeds and speeds for your small entry level machines and I show you oh, nice. chip size and and I did it and, re- and I left the audio in on purpose because it's not just a visual thing. It's an audio audible thing. So, you know, t- turn the volume down if you go find that video, but it, uh, that that's a very important video, especially if you get a new, a new machine. So I do have this, uh, we call it a surfacing bit cause it's named properly. What? I was able to find it. Yeah, I know. I don't know why, but that that bit just brings me such joy. I, I call it the magic eraser. That's a good way to put it. Oh, you missed a spot. No, it's going to do a final lap. Oh, of course it is. This is clearing the inside and then doing a final pass. A little jumpy. I apologize. Yeah, Look that that, wide in, angle. that industrial machine I was telling you about. I have a four inch. Uh, fly cutter like that Ooh. and when the spoil board gets a little beat up just run that one pass over it and I, that's why I call it the magic eraser is it makes it brand new nice well and, and what we'll say about those those fly cutter bits you may not have a CNC but it doesn't matter that RC2255 that bit is fantastic if you're a router guy doing a lot of slab leveling if you've got a router jig that you're using to flatten out slabs, that particular bit is what you want. It, it's got uh, unique teeth, uh, unique cutter design, and it's got a lot of air uh, aerodynamics to it. So the chips fly, plenty of airflow, and those have four edges on the cutter. So you can keep rotating those around. So well worth the money. And for what it does, it's fantastic whether you got a CNC or a hand router just looking to flatten stuff. So everyone just mute your speakers for just a second. I found the video. So earlier we were talking about the four box. Ah, there we go. Oh. If you give me an hour, I'll find it. <laughs> and the last video in the list is the core box bit. Coming around the first corner. Taking out that, is that walnut? No, that was that rosewood. Oh, that's right. That was when I was tinkering with funky 
designs on those trays. Should call it pine. That's pretty. Well, there you go. That was fun. And Mr. Chris, I'd like to let you know that the uh, servicing bit is the RC2255 by Amana. He must be listening to us with no headphones on. Just like watching instead of not instead of listening. I think He's smart that. about it. He's definitely not listening. <laughs> oh, I love that guy. So let's see. I think that was. You guys know of any other ones that you'd like me to show? Because we saw. Oh, you know what? It, how much time you got, Kyle? Because since this will be the last time for a little yeah, while, I'll have got, you on. I got time. Okay, cool. I'm thinking about these three, the carving ones from Chris, where he did his. Let's see what this one is real quick. Oh, the 3D. Oh. A little slow mo. Ultra no, that's, slow mo. That's a uh, round nose. Yep, it's a ball nose. Ball nose. I'm used to I'm used to router bits. I apologize. And then we have this one. Yeah, when your uh, skirt on your dust boots not quite long enough, it leaves your bit hanging out a little too far. I could not even going to, nope, just going to go ahead into this one. <laughs> that's, that's not the same thing. That's a little different. Yeah, you, you yeah. see how he has a project that's not very detailed, so he's able to get away with that larger ball nose, which lets him cut it quicker. If he had a very detailed, he'd have to switch to a smaller taper ball nose. Is, so that's what comes back and is cleaning up all these lines that we see here, right? Mm -hmm. Is a smaller ball nose? Yeah. Okay. Well, there eventually there there will be. Yeah, the, the bigger oh, one just, right. just did sort of a rough cut and got it all milled down to um, to a better shape. And if you look behind the bit, you'll see those little step, stair steps. Mm -hmm. That one, that one's done on a on a was roughed out on a separate file. So once this ball nose gets done with that process, I had another smaller bit kind of coming around and doing all the detail work. Okay, and then we have this one. Is this the detail work? Maybe. Looks like it was yeah. detail work. Yeah, I think it was. So there on the left side, you have the... Oh, yeah. You're going the opposite way, it looks like. Yep. And then you have your your pre-milling marks with a bigger ball nose there. Yep. Now, yeah. how how many hours realistically of cutting? And Because I, I know you had some troubles with this one with bit slipping and stuff, which is why you were saying earlier to always make sure to mic the shank to make sure it is close to what it says. Um, but how many realistic hours did you have just in, in proper cutting on that? If everything would have worked the way it was supposed to have worked, it would have only taken me about eight out seven to eight hours. Okay. But I got five, five or six hours into the first one when it failed. I got, you know, three hours into the second one when it failed. And so, you know, I had multiple, I don't know what, four times where I had to re basically redesign that thing. And I, you probably remember that project, Kyle, because I, there was at one point I just reached out to the Facebook group and said, listen, I'm done. So if you got any ideas, please let me know. He's about to burn it. I remember that one. Chris was find, stressing over that one. Trying to find a completed picture because we didn't talk about it first or second episode of this, of, of yeah. the What Not podcast. Wednesday nights, nine o'clock. So I'm just trying to look for that now. But anyways, please continue. Yeah, I know there's a couple photos out there that we've had of it. But yeah, when I when I was looking for those bits, I was trying to to find images of the same project, just so it would show variance in how the different ball nose would react. So yeah. it turned out good in the end, though. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was happy. The most important thing the customer was happy. That's all I really cared about. That, that is the most important step there. Yep. And every redesign and every redesign and every redesign, he goes, man, I like that even better than the last time. I thought originally <laughs> he was just blowing smoke, but it turned out that he really did. And I was like, well, we should have done this to begin with. And 
you know, anyway, but you know, like CNC fun. can be so much fun. It really can. It can also be a, a point where you're just, you're ready to just, you know, push it out in the yard and let the rain take it over. But that's the joy of any kind of woodworking, you know, and that's why CNC, and I don't care what people say, CNC is woodworking. You have to have an understanding of what that wood is going to do when you remove amounts of wood off one side or when you cut it with or against the grain, you have to, you still have to know all those things. So, um, there's a lot of woodworking knowledge that goes into CNC. And if you don't have that, you learn it pretty quick. Yep. Yeah. I treat CNC just like another tool in the shop, just like a table saw router, whatever you want. Yep. Let's see. JP's said that, uh, my jigsaw went flying across the shop the other day. You shouldn't have thrown it. Take it. It wasn't a festival. So wouldn't have thrown that. Not sponsored. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> True. But yep. there was something I was looking at. Oh, okay. So an, I think this is an important accessory, and I didn't believe it was an important accessory until Chris brought it to my attention, and that's Aura Mask. Because what happens if you have a project, you you know, maybe you just have plywood laying around and you want to paint it and you want to make it detailed looking. So we had this video and that's what reminded me of it. Yeah, that there's a eighth inch. I believe that was a down cut. And that's cutting out, uh, that's uh, MDF. So I was painted white first, then carved like you see there with the aura mask applied on top of the white. Mm -hmm. And then you would paint the carving and then pull off the aura mask at the end. And that would, it's basically a masking to uh, get some clean uh, paint lines on your carves. Whoa. Yeah, that went quick all of a sudden, didn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah, you, can see the, you can see the paint on the edge there a little bit where it's painted white. Loppiness. Now, the key to the aura mask is good adhesion. If you don't have good adhesion, you're going to have issues. And the way I use that, I use one of those rubber rollers. Apply it on the surface and use that rubber ruler, press down real firm to get it up high good. Another thing is you have to have a paint or a sealer on the material first. Now, do you sand that down so it's extra smooth and then put the paint on? Or yeah, you... Okay. What I would do, like MDF, I would sand, prime, paint, let it dry really good, and then apply the wear mask, and then do the final carvings if if I need to do any more carving. Well, basically, you would do you do that V carving next, and then cut the profile out like I did there, and then you would paint the carving. You can paint the edge if you wanted to, and then peel off the ore mask last. Okay. And you and can I, put multiple layers of aura mask on if you have multiple colors that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, that's true too. And another thing with like MDF, you want to seal that before you try to put paint in there in the carving. I usually use a shellac to seal the grain of the MDF and that, so it's not so porous. It is nothing but a dry sponge. Yep. Uh, JP said, speaking of Amana, he snapped his Amana countersink bit. His drill was in hammer mode. His hammer modo. <laughs> yeah, he does. Yeah, he does have hammer modo. It's a new feature. It's that, that Gulf Coast talk. A, a Spanish for mode. And I think I know what he was talking about here, but I'm just going to go ahead and leave it. He said, uh, leave that one wide open, Chris. So I'm just now catching up on some of them. He said, nah, jigsaws are Satan's power tools. No, they're just inverted scroll saws. Not if you hold them the other way. <laughs> Actually, you know what's really funny is that you went where you have the uh, the older crowd because we did learn not to call them old timers. Uh, the older crowd would come in and and they would call a jigsaw a scroll saw because originally hmm. that's what they were called. No. Oh. Uh, Never forget the first time I had ever heard that because I'm thinking, yeah, the blades are right here and they're real tiny. I'm like, no, 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 no. They're bigger blades than that. You learn something new every day. I call it scroll saw the manual CNC. There that's, you go. I, that's how I started. I was scroll saw on signs, and I'm like, there's got to be a better way than this. And then <laughs> got in the CNCs. Did you build one of those in your bedroom when you were 14? 
the scroll saw? Yeah. yeah. No, that one I had to buy. Oh, yeah. 15 Craftsman. and a half. It only took him like three months to realize there's a better way. Yeah. Yeah, he mounted a coping saw blade on the end of a reciprocating something, you know, just constantly moving, <laughs> like a sewing machine. Yeah. He turned a sewing machine into a scroll saw. But I just don't, the patience, I just don't have the patience for the scroll saw. Like uh, Sterling Davis, he he scrolls. And I don't know, it's like he, he doesn't change necessarily, but you can tell he goes to a place when he starts scrolling that he's calmer, he's just more relaxed when he's doing it, he's in a different space. That's a good way to put it. He's so a different he mindset. Moonshine. I was going to bring up the actual reason of why he was in that space, but <laughs> well, not while he's woodworking, but I'm just saying, you know. I don't know. Scroll sawing woodworking. Totally kidding. Well, actually, I know... now that it's... yeah, good. Go ahead and go for it. Oh, I was going to say that there's a Tyler, the, um, oh my gosh, I knew I'd forget it. The artisan pirate. There you go. He's always posting stuff and got him onto that aura mask. And now it's it's changed the way he's doing CNC projects from before because I saw him taping off and I thought, hey, Chris mentioned this stuff is for that. So I mentioned it to him and sure enough, he's been using the crap out of it and he's been doing really cool projects with it. So, and originally he's a scroller that turned to CNC for certain projects. So I'm mostly joking with him. Well, now that's an interesting thought though, is True. you could actually use that on scroll saw projects. Say what now? The or mask? That mask on scroll saw project. So imagine sometimes you want the face being one color, but you want all the parts inside to be a darker color so it makes the face stand out. Mm -hmm. That or mask would allow you to do that. Sweet. There's a lot of options with that stuff. Yeah. So, well, I know we have got a lot of cool guests coming up the rest of the month. We do? Yeah, we do. <laughs> We already had your coolest one. I was going to say, we're already done. And we just ended. I mean, we, we started the month on the right there track. So it's, it can only <laughs> go down from here, right? There you go. To the next guest, I'm just picking. <laughs> no, but we are actually, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, Chris is in charge of guest acquisition. So if you would like to be on the show and be a guest and have the screening by Chris, facebook.com slash whatnot podcast or Instagram dot com slash whatnot podcast would be a good way to get a hold of us uh, so you can do that or if you want to get a hold of chris his personal page is instagram.com slash chris cross crafts and if you have a free weekend and you want to watch me stir paint mine is duff style one yes and don't forget patreon.com slash whatnot right. podcast Yep. If you want to be as awesome as Kyle and, you know, get sponsored with the whatnot podcast, that's the best way to do it is get a hold of us on Patreon. Yep. And we know that, uh, you may, you may not have, you may have showed up here late. Feel free to go check out last week's episode. If you're into CNC, it's well worth the watch. And, uh, you know, we, we, we go long on important topics like CNC. You know, where do we get to finish? Who knows? Mike's going to talk for four hours on that one. I mean, just, just we so covered much. finishing. <clears throat> Not like we will, though. No, that's true. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, Chris is now screening. So sorry, JP Brown. I guess you can't make it back on. No, he's still got that miter station he's working on. I can't wait to see more about that and that video for his pocket hole jigs. But yes, uh, I mean, we've got a ton of topics that we can cover. We just we actually started falling into this whole third person thing and really enjoying the crap out of it because we can bring talented people in the woodworking community that you may not have known about to your front monitor. I was going to say doorstep, and I was like, well, that's creepy. You could back that up. Yeah. So, hey, on that note, everyone, good night. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, we're trying to all sign a petition to uh, get Gerald Vance to come on. Uh, we'd love to see him on here. Yes. So if you want to sign that petition, feel free to uh, you know let us know. <laughs> Actually, Gerald, JP, it's the him. other way around. Uh, people will be sponsoring us. And then we just have you on the show. Yeah, we he sponsor that each is. other. Yeah, we sponsor each other. That's how it goes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Gerald Vance would be great to have on. And I was thinking about it. What do you call him? The, his, the historical woodworker? The his, yeah, the history woodworker. History, history woodworker. woodworker. Yeah. I say in order to get around his publicist, we call him the history woodworker. Hmm. And then get him on, then promote the Appalachian Heritage Woodshop. Faked you out, publicist, man. Yeah. By the way, not sponsored. <clears throat> but in this case, we could actually get him on because he is, he is going to, well, I want to get him on because he's going to hit that threshold and push into the 
superstardom, we won't be able to have him on the podcast. You know, he's just going to be too much. He's going to be too busy. That's why we got Kyle on now, because in another month or two, he's going to be too big for us, and we can't we can't get him. That is the truth. Kyle doesn't realize it. He's he's on his own threshold. He's ready to go. Yep. Never too big. Never too big. But at the same time, make sure you check out LearnYourCNC.com to get a hold of that introductory price before Kyle decides that, oh, crap, today's September 1st. I was supposed to raise it today. Yep. And keep check on the, uh, you know, with your own Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Keep check on us. We'll keep you updated on uh, the upcoming guests. And, uh, you yeah, know, hopefully we'll see you back again here next Wednesday night at 9 p.m. And, Kyle, we do appreciate your time, my friend. It's always a pleasure to hang out with you. Hey, I had you. a great time. Thank you. Really appreciate you coming on. <clears throat> well, I guess, right. l- l- wait, I get to say my line tonight. You do. And I guess on behalf of the What Not Podcast, we'll see and see you next time. <laughs> oh, oh, my gosh. Where's the buttons for this thing that I can shut it off with? Ooh, wait, I got one for you. Good night, everyone. Have a good time. <laughs> <laughs>